Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. 
Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Audio streaming of today's council meeting starts at 1pm local time. Streaming is paused during breaks. Good afternoon, councillors and staff of the council and the public. Welcome to our meeting. Today, can I um, first of all remind people that we do record and we are on air, we're live, so if you could switch your mobiles off, it really helps the, re the recording process and less interruptions. Uh, please be seated. Thank you. We have no apologies. Declaration of interest. No, no declaration of interest. Confirmation minutes. Some have been moved the minutes of the meeting held on the 28th of January. Moves Councillor Spencer, second to Deputy Mayor. All those in favour, please raise your hand. And that is all councillors present. That is carried. There's no deputations, no petitions, no community reports. Um, public questions on notice are there from the previous meeting. Public questions without notice. Are there any public questions without notice? No? I will sit down. That's right. Oh, thank you. Come on through. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Robin Smith on behalf of Coffee Republic. Question about the uh, two questions today, please. One about the thylacine sculptures in the Brisbane Street Mall. I'm referring to an article in the paper, 5th of February, where you're quoted to say, while there are some people who don't like the placement of the thylacines at ground level, and I'm wondering. They've been removed thus far. I look at the plans originally from 2015, which had the size of the sculptures, and albeit an artist's illustrations, certainly they seem to be about waist high in, in the body of the, the animals. 
And on page 83, there's a map of where they should be. Together with skeletons set in the ground, 49 footprints throughout the mall, together with moving images and projections, and a further sculpture. The ones that have been removed thus far, I take it, were identified from the article as being the most um, collided with. My observation is, having worked in the mall for 20 years now, people don't seem to have had trouble with anything at standard height, but certainly the thylacines that remain in the mall today are also um, too low to be considered safe. Would you consider the ones remaining safe, firstly? And the second part of the question is, we don't seem to have got the full installation as promised. Yeah, look, I can't answer that. The full installation, we can probably, do you want to answer that one, CEO, at all? Or? In terms of? The full installation, why, and it's not quite like it was. Oh, the thanks, Mayor. Look, I think in respect of the, the initial um, and approved concept plan that was um, went through the council meeting, clearly there was a process in the installation and construction of the mall which involved extensive consultation with retailers, which one of, one of whom was no doubt yourself. Um, that saw changes to those plans over the over the, the iteration over the, the the period that it was that it was constructed. So, so not all elements of the of the mall um, as it was um, constructed was entirely with what what the initial approved plan was. But um, the um, the best balance in terms of trying to meet the, the needs of retailers versus the um, the approved plan was um, was what was sought. Thank you. Next question. Oh, and the safety to do, I, I, yeah, I, I think the, the ones there are safe if you look where you're going. Thank you. The, I'll have a follow-up question now because of that, in answer to that, with respect. The mall, and I don't think it's unfair to say, has been criticised as being somewhat, typically a word is bland and empty and possibly not finished on. And I don't think that's unreasonable to quote that. The mall was supposed to have the main theme, thematic feature to the mall was these installations, whether they be the small 49 footprints throughout the length of the mall. Well, actually, they started in Charles Street slightly, and they ran to St John Street. But there were 49 individual bronze sets that were supposed to go in of a, of a poor footprint. Your there question, was supposed please. to be a skeleton. Question, please. There was supposed to be a skeleton as well. As we've only got approximately half of the installations, do I take it that that is yet to be finished, or was that cancelled, as the general manager alluded to, after consultation with traders? Correct. I think that's been answered by the previous answer. All right. Any other questions? Yes. On the... Um, that's your third one. Well, one was a follow-up question. I'm happy to come back next meeting, Mr Mayor. Would yes, you rather sir. I do that? No, one more. Yeah, you can have one. Thank you. Yeah. I'm happy to give away if there's someone else has a question. No, you can have another question now. Uh, this document, it is from 2015. We were given 96 hours as a trader to review it, and it is quite a document. Um, the Birchalls and um, Patterson Street car park and bus interchange development is, is very promising, and I am very grateful that the state government and council are working on it. However, given that we were only given 96 hours on this, which was about a $50 million project, um, will the traders and public and ratepayers be given an opportunity to view the proposals before they're advanced too far, as they seem to be with the... It was the Launceston City Heart People, Places and Lifestyle Project. That was about a $50 million one. Will we be given much of an opportunity to review the plans before they get too far advanced? Yes, certainly. Yes. Yes, thank you. Any further questions? Good afternoon. Mayor and councillors, dear councillors, this matter is specifically referred to each and every councillor. Important matters are drawn to our association's attention by members in the community in general. It's unusual, in fact unheard of in our experience in dealing with local government council matters in Tasmania for a council to provide deposit monies to a private purchaser for a property and furthermore to place a municipal council in the position 
of being a guarantor to purchase a contract for real estate. We therefore ask if any councillor is aware and or did council approve the use of council funds in the provision of a $1.2 million deposit check, bank check on 9th of July 2020 for a proposed purchase of 4143 Patterson Street, Launceston by Creative Property Holdings Proprietary Limited from Car Park Super Proprietary Limited and furthermore aware that officers of council signed a form on behalf of council as guarantor in relation to the said proposed purchase agreement now breached and the said deposit funds of $1.2 million being likely unsecured and have not as yet been refunded to council. Thank you. Thank you. I think each council will have to answer that for themselves. Thank you. Well, I'd like you as mayor and a councillor to provide an answer, thank you, in a timely manner. Well, in due course, we can provide an answer. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take it on notice. Any other questions? No. Under the provisions of the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act of 1993, Council acts as a planning authority in regard to the items included in Agenda Item 9. No speakers for 9, 9.1. Somebody happy to move a motion? Move Councillor McKenzie. Seconded. Councillor Finlay, thank you. Councillor McKenzie, you wish to speak to it? Look, I do, Mayor. Um, thank you. Again, I've reviewed the documentation in relation to the proposal and the recommendation made by the officers. Again, I guess I go and I see these infill blocks all the time happening in and around Launceston and good, I guess, town planning reasons for doing that. I don't necessarily say I love the look of some of them and some of the ones I saw on the other side of the fence today, I'm not sure that I'd love to be living in them, but the reality of it is the planning scheme provides opportunity for people to build on the back of blocks and it does provide good density um, for those people who don't want to have large open spaces to manage. Um, within this proposal, there are a number of discretions uh, including side setback, uh, overshadowing issues, well, sorry, no, that's not a, a, a uh, parking for visitors and privacy, which is la largely designed on the driveway. So just looking through each of those, the side setbacks are less than what the minimum requires for setbacks, uh, but then under the performance criteria, they've been assessed to sit within the realms of that, uh, re realms of, 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 uh, of being OK. Um, I look at it, and again, at the moment, we have trees, I think, on the western side, which are overshadowing the blocks, potentially, uh, to the west, uh, and where most of the overshadowing will take place, and that will effectively, the trees will come out and will be taken over by the, uh, by the building that's being uh, constructed on that site. Again, looking at the shadow diagrams, they meet the criteria in relation to amenity and the number of hours that they're covering uh, the, backpack, uh, the, 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 uh, the backyard, and there are no habitable rooms that are severely impacted by the overshadowing either. Um, in relation to parking for visitors, normally we would require one parking spot for each of the residences there uh, for visitor parking. And in this case, it's been determined that it's OK not to do that based on the uh, the street that's there and the ability for people to park on street in relation to there. Um, and in relation to the privacy, that really relates to the driveway, which is meant to be three metres wide, uh, that goes down alongside the, uh, the property in front of the new one dwelling to be, to be built, um, as opposed to three million, uh, three, 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 three metres. Um, so not a significant uh, use of discretion in regards to that. So my overall assessment, uh, which is often the case in large regards to these things where we have uh, uh, performance criteria, they've been assessed by the, the, the officer and I see no reason today not to support this proposal. Just briefly, I guess one of the um, points that the representation picked up on was the question around the, uh, there being already multiple dwellings in the street. Uh, I think it's important to note that there is no maximum uh, and that therefore that would not be a reasonable uh, condition by which the council would reject the application. Also take on board uh, some of the comments made in the representations with regard to 
uh, it being a dead end street, and whilst that's definitely referenced uh, by the planner as, uh, I guess, assisting in terms of the visitor parking, also note that neighbours have uh, experienced challenges with regard to the parking provisions already there, so just, I guess, would encourage the developer to be aware of that and to develop relationships with the neighbour should this application be passed today to uh, ensure that there's an ongoing uh, relationship in that street rather than anything else and um, would encourage that to occur. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor McKenna, you wish to close? I'll put the motion. Those in favour, please raise your hand. And that is all councillors present. That is carried. We move on to announcements by the Mayor. And just to say it was a pleasure to attend the 10 days of the attend the 10 days of the island launch. Um, fantastic program, very exciting, so I trust we'll be able to get along to enjoy that in the coming, not too far away, a few months, a few weeks' time. Also, the key to the city, I just want to say it was a fantastic day. Weather turned it on for us as well, but thank the staff CEO to um, Elizabeth and the team for the way they pulled it together. I think they did a fantastic job, and also to Councillor McKenzie for his involvement in making sure that it was a great success on the day. And indulge. I've got the pleasure to go there, and I just want to say it was a great, great effort, a fantastic um, on a Saturday night while I was there. It was a good atmosphere, a lot of people there, but also I was next to a table of another ten who were all the way from Hobart, and they were singing the praises that Festivali were willing to, and it was a good time, and I was sitting right next to them, I thought. Anyway, it was great that they were so thankful that they could come up and enjoy something in our city when Hobart didn't have anything at the like that this year. So they were very appreciative, so congratulations to all those involved, especially the many volunteers that helped make Indulge a great success. And that'll be it from myself, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I've got four things that I'd like to share today. The first is with regard to an informal function that we had last week as a celebration for stakeholders with regard to the launch of the city's inaugural cultural strategy. It was wonderful to have a variety of players and stakeholders come together at the QV Mag in the outdoor area in the backyard to uh, celebrate, I guess, the milestone that was the launch late last year of our inaugural strategy. But most importantly, to hear of so many things that are happening within the community, within the space. We undertook the opportunity which allowed lots of those organisations present to share for a minute or two what it is that's keeping them busy at the beginning of the year. And there was just a plethora of activities, events, functions, uh, installations, programs, pathways that are occurring. So I'd really like to uh, thank all of those people that attended. Mayor, you were there, as well as councillors Mackenzie, Harris and Walker, uh, and of course all councillors for their ongoing support as we move toward the development of the implementation framework and eventually the advisory committee. Mayor, the second thing that I wanted to mention was a new partnership between the QV MAG and the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra. You might have noticed in the media that uh, members of the TSO uh, were playing at the art gallery uh, as part of two concerts that occurred on Saturday the 30th of January and there's two more performance days coming up, uh, one in two weeks time and another in April. And it sees, I guess, the opportunity for the QV Mag to branch out with other cultural institutions within Tasmania, but importantly to increase our visitation. You can imagine what it was like having a quartet of musicians of the calibre of the TSO performing in our own gallery upstairs. It was incredible. So I'd really like to congratulate uh, Tracy and the team at the QV Mag, together with Caroline and Sam from the TSO, who brought that to that relationship to reality. And we look forward to uh, seeing that continue to prosper into the future. Mr Mayor, you've mentioned indulge. Um, I'd also like to uh, publicly congratulate our own team at the stadium for the work that they did uh, in working with the volunteer committee of Festivali to bring that event to fruition. It's a, a step into brave new territory, I think, having people uh, dine and uh, enjoy food and wine on the turf, but my word, it worked, and it, I guess, brought to, uh, brought to us all the variety of uses that that stadium can be uh, used for. And finally, Mayor, I'd love to mention that Council has been uh, named as a finalist 
in the Australian Street Art Awards, set to be announced on the 2nd of March with our project Electric Botany, of course involving local emerging artists and importantly over 200 school students who have been uh, working as part of the project as we decorated 51, as the artists and students and staff decorated 51 signal boxes to uh, in be incorporated into the art trail. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. I just wanted to add a couple of things to your remarks and to the Deputy's remarks around indulge. And I think, for me, one of the things that COVID has, uh, has taught us and hopefully uh, has taught the community is that when you have something that's, that's bad and uh, causes angst, that good things can come out of it. And the indulge is a classic case of that. If two years ago someone had said, we're going to have a massive big marquee on Utah Stadium and people will willingly embrace that. There might have been some, some eyebrows raised, some, some queries, will it work? Well, it worked. And I think what I hope happened is that there were people out there looking at the success of it, looking to, to do other similar things there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any other? Councillor Finlay. Uh, thanks, Mayor. One of the things that was in your list to note, the Launceston Henley Regatta, I just thought I might add a positive voice to that. It was really fantastic to see um, rowing on the river. Obviously, with Barrington about to host the Nationals at the end of March, that's a world-class facility. Um, but it's very rare for people that go and watch a rowing regatta to actually see the start of a race. In the 500 metre sprint, they brought them down the river, turned them around and started them on the finish line. Uh, and there's only a few places in the world that you can do that. And so it's great to see our river um, hold an event of such a great class uh, and to have a fantastic weekend on the river. Thank you. Any other reports? No? Counts questions from councillors? Deputy Mayor? Thanks, Mayor. Uh, noting that the City of Launceston is a member of the Tamer Estuary Management Task Force, or TEMPT, established, of course, under the City deal, there's no mention of the membership of the task force on their website. So, as part of question one, two questions. Who are the members and who is the secretary? And question two, what date are the members of TEMPT expecting the final version of the long-awaited sediment report? I see you. Thanks, Mr Mayor. The Deputy Mayor actually gave me the, the, the courtesy of um, pre-warning of the question so I can answer, answer it in full. So, the composition of TEMPT is determined by invite of the responsible minister within the Tasmanian government. So the current membership of the task force is as follows. So Infrastructure Tasmania, uh, they provide the chair. Uh, the City of Launceston, the West Tamar Council, the Meander Valley Council, the Northern Midlands Council, the Georgetown Council, the Tamar Estuary and Esk River Partnership, NRM North, uh, Tas Water, Hydro Tasmania, the Department of Prime Industries, Water uh, Parks, rather uh, Water and Environment. Additionally, the, the the Launceston Flood Authority and the Launceston Chamber of Commerce have recently received and accepted invitations to join the task force. Um, and infrastructure, infrastructure Tasmania is currently performing a secretary of tempt. Oh, and so in, in respect to the second question. Um, so the sediment review is a substantial piece of work which has experienced recent scope creep to ensure that it considers the various proposals and issues which have been raised by the community. So the attempt will be meeting in the next two weeks and will receive an update on progress with the review. So I'll be able to provide more information in respect to the, exec the expected delivery date for the review report once this meeting has been held. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Spencer? I just got a question about the uh, black spot funding. If we can get the council to go to Michael McCormick or um, Gavin Pearce, who's the chairman in Tasmania, to try and get some funding for the intersection between Hobart Road and Relbia Road. Um, there's talk of there could be developments down there, and I think it's a bad spot at the moment without more traffic. So I would like to see if we can get some funding through the Black Spot program. Yes, that's... Thank you. Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I will apologise to the CEO for not giving you forewarning for this question. Um, hopefully it's fairly straightforward and uh, you'll be able to answer that. I note that the residents of Invermay who are not happy with the decision for Veolia to locate uh, their uh, business on Churchill Park Drive 
um, are still um, organising and, and, and wishing to oppose that development. Now, of course, that was approved uh, through the uh, planning process um, on appeal. Uh, but, you know, bearing in mind that this area, apart from being residential, also does uh, contain recreational, uh, especially an item that we're going to be considering later today, um, and educational uh, and cultural facilities, as, as well as um, uh, um, recreational uh, park facilities, uh, what uh, actions can the Council consider uh, to rezone the light industrial area to avoid any further developments that may also have a negative impact on uh, residents in that area? Thank you. A CEO? Mr Mayor, so it's the opportunity to be able to, to look at the, the future zoning, obviously through measures like we're, we're about to review the Greater Lawn System Plan, um, and that does um, include uh, provision of future industrial or current um, industrial, future residential, so that would be a mechanism to explore the opportunity to, to, to um, if, if there's a need or, or um, a desirability to make change, um, it, it, it needs to have a sound strategic argument before it can translate through to actual um, planning, um, changing of the planning instrument or the planning scheme. So my suggestion would be that would be the, um, the appropriate place to start. Thank you. No further questions? We move on to 12, 13, 13.1 pedestrian and bike committee. Someone happy to move? Councillor McKenzie, second to Councillor Harris. Councillor McKenzie, you wish to speak to it? Just, just to acknowledge the dot point two about Malcolm Cohen, who stepped down from the committee. Malcolm's done an absolutely fantastic job of cycling in and around northern Tasmania, not just the City Council, and we certainly uh, are very grateful for the efforts that he put into the Pedestrian Bike Committee over many years. So uh, just wanting to publicly acknowledge that. Thank you. I'll put the motion. Those in favour, please raise your hand. That is all councillors present. That is carried. So 13.2, Launceston Access Advisory Committee. Move Councillor Dawkins. Second, Deputy Mayor. Do you wish to speak to it, Councillor Dawkins? Yes, please. Um, we met on the 9th of December, which was obviously a really good day for us because we um, were able to show everyone our access framework for, for our access framework for action. Uh, so the meeting itself was obviously one of great triumph, but what was also good about it is we get to, to talk to some of these uh, other strategies around the draft transport strategy and the St John Street and Patterson Street redesigns. So this is where we want to be, at the beginning of those conversations so that the developers understand the access needs of people that sit around that table. So we'll have another meeting soon. We'll report back with some of our deliverables in our priority action areas and we hope to see more uh, interest in this subject in the future. Uh, thank you. Deputy Mayor, no. any other council wish to speak? I'll put the motion. Those in favour? That's all councillors present. That is carried. 14.1, the workshop report. Move, Deputy Mayor. Second to Councillor Finlay. Wish to speak to it, Deputy Mayor? Councillor Finlay? Any councillor wish to speak? I'll put the motion. Those in favour, please raise your hand. And that is all councillors present. That is carried. 15.1, Councillor Dawkins, happy to move. The the motion you're moving first? Yes. Can you read the motion so people know that haven't seen it? City of Launceston to investigate traffic calming measures. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Before I do, we have to speak. There are speak. speakers, yes. There are speakers. Yeah. I did forget about that, so my apologies. <laughs> Melody West. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor. That's fine. Thank you, councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to be a civic participant today and to present you with an authentic Trevallon residence account in support of Councillor Dawkins' motion <clears throat> to consider traffic calming measures, particularly along a stretch of our community, which connects us with the city and the gorge, our shops, sporting grounds and our school, and for many of us, our homes and places of residence. I grew up in Trevallon. My parents bought a cottage in Broadview Crescent and later built a house in Newland Street. They walked me to what was then called the Bain Terrace Kindergarten and then later to Trevallon Primary School. As kids, my brothers and I walked and rode our bikes to the Trevallon shop, to parks, to the gorge and to the houses of our friends. We walked to the city all of the time. 
I left Tassie, but I returned a dec after a decade of globe trotting, met my partner, had two children of our own, and bought our first house in a five minute walking distance between the two houses I grew up in. A likely Tasmanian story, perhaps. We've lived in our home for almost 10 years, and now our children also go to Trevallon Primary. We're members of the Trevallon Tennis Club. We know everyone in the shop, pharmacy, and bakery by name. So I know Trevallon. We love Trevallon and all that it has to offer, but I cannot live in the same Trevallon I did growing up. Of course, life speeds up and things change, but I speak on behalf of our community when I say that our traffic management needs to change and catch up too, and it needs to change now. Fortunately, Trevallon has a lot to offer people outside of our suburb. Our lively MTB and trail running communities come to Trevallon from all over Launceston to utilise the incredible resource that is the Trevallon Recreation Reserve. I have a feeling that residents from our neighbouring suburbs also may use Trevallon as a thoroughfare, particularly during peak traffic times when the West Tamer Highway is likely to be congested. Now, we're a very inclusive bunch in Trevallon. We love to share our suburb with others. However, it is our collective opinion that an increase in traffic, particularly in the stretch of road that connects us to the city and the gorge, has meant that the safety and wellbeing of our residents is currently compromised to, agree, to a degree where we feel the need to take action. We thank the City of Launceston for signage and other measures taken to slow traffic down, but we're not sure it's enough. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. I don't know how to follow that. I think she covered everything. Um, I will say, though, that I've worked um, in the health sector for about 30 years, and when we talk about keeping our cities livable and talk, keeping our community active, then active transport's the way to go, and at the moment that's very difficult in Trevallon. I dare any of you to get on a push bike and try and get up on Trevallon Hill either on the road, good luck, or on the footpath. So on a Wednesday morning in particular when the bins are out, it's a shocker. And we do like to keep our children active and our community active. So I heard somebody earlier mention COVID, and I'd say again, uh, what our lovely Premier has taught us during COVID, is Tasmania's kept ahead of the game by being bold and agile. I hope you'll do the same. Thank yes. you. Any other? No other? Oh, there's another speaker. I haven't got a name, so. Anna. Um, hello, it's, I'm Anna Povey, and uh, I live in Gorge Road. I've lived there for 25 years and um, we've got one of those awful driveways where you have to back out into the traffic. Um, it used to be that the peak hour, you could stand there and peak hour went past in about five minutes. But the traffic is increasing and we can't just keep letting this happen around Launceston and just accept it as some sort of rule of nature. It's not a rule of nature. It comes down to what um, traffic management plans are put into place. And as Heidi said, it's really important for us to have an active community. It's important for us to um, restrain the dominance of cars in our city that impact on all aspects of our lives. So it needs to be that we can back out of our driveway safely when we do have to go in a car. But our whole family uses bicycles. You've probably seen us around. I had an old man came up to me in the trail on shops and he said, you've been riding that bicycle up that hill for years. And I have the very same bicycle. So um, it, I enjoy riding a bike, but a lot of people aren't as confident as I am. And so, you know, we need to make these measures possible for everybody to do. So to ride their bikes, whether it's on the footpath or on the road, um, and to walk safely. Um, so we have to do that, as Hayley said, boldly. We can't just let the cars keep dominating and then go, oh dear, we don't seem to have enough people keeping fit and healthy. Um, so I, I suggest that whatever you do, whether it's a 40 k's an hour zone or otherwise, I think that we need to have strong visual and textural indicators that work on people's psychology to slow them down. It's not enough to smooth the roads, which we've been doing all around the world, smoothing the roads and trying to make them safer, and all that happens is people drive faster and faster. So in a lot of countries, they've now realised that actually making the roads appear narrower, for instance, by putting the white lines closer together or putting textural indicators, all sorts of things, work on people's subconscious so that they start to drive more safely. So I beg you to consider all those Thank possibilities. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Any other speakers? No? 
Councillor Dawkins, can you read the motion now, please? Thank you, ma'am. Um, City of Launceston to investigate traffic calming safety measures for Gorge and Trevallon roads and report back with implementation strategies. I have a second from Councillor Cox. Councillor Dawkins, you wish to speak? Yes, please. Um, this motion is before us today because members of uh, my community in Trevallon have been contacting me since I was first elected representative in 2014. Now, at that time, I didn't act because we had some very robust discussions around how the city heart was going to increase, how we were going to make Launceston a more livable city. Working from the Girl Report from 2011, how we were going to make sure that people had the choice so that cars did not always have primacy, but that people uh, on cycles, on scooters, walking, people with push chairs, people in wheelchairs, so that everybody had some kind of level playing field to be able to access our community. And also, so we slowed down. You know, we were looking for ways after the global financial crisis to, to look inward, to look to our communities for all that we needed, to slow down and make the most of the life that we had within our communities. Now, a long time's passed and we still haven't got there. I know that the last iteration of the traffic calming measures in the city gave us some hope that we're going to be there in the next year or two, but we've still got a long way to go, and my community in Trevallon couldn't wait anymore to find out what those traffic calming measures might be and if they can be extrapolated wider into our communities. So this motion's here today to test to see whether our suburbs can join in that cry for safer, calmer traffic communities. It, Travel and Gorge Road are a fantastic place to start because it's a really interesting little part of Launceston. We've got two entrances to the gorge, one at Kingsbridge, one past the school. We've got a school. We've got an oval for cricket and football and all sorts of other activities. We've got a park at South Bank. We've got a burgeoning community centre, a supermarket, bakery, hairdresser, contractors, news agent, a whole range of facilities available to people, but no real way to access them safely. If you live on the gorge side of Trevallon, you cannot walk into town if you've got a push-up. It is not possible. I think that's remiss of us to not make that possible for someone. The only way to even remotely feasibly do it is to get to the supermarket and try and cross, cross there on the traffic island. Not even enough space for you to stand there with a pusher if you had one. There isn't enough space with dogs. We want this community and all our <coughs> communities to have this kind of activity available to them. And some might say, why travel and why not somewhere else? Well, yes, somewhere else. This motion doesn't preclude any other area trialling traffic calming measures. This is just the step that we're making today if I'm able to get support for this motion. I know there was some pushback on some of the measures that I'd suggested in the original motion. We didn't want to look at 40 kilometres. We don't specifically want to look at um, speed humps or other measures that might have been tried in the past. OK, let's look at some new, innovative, interesting ways of doing it. I truly believe, and I believe that Councillor Cox will back me up on this when he speaks, that 40 is the new 50. It's being tried in Hobart at the moment, and I believe it's here to stay. Whether or not it's this year, next year, or in five years, I believe that is the future. We do not want to continue this idea that a man in his car is king, which our previous Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, enjoyed saying whenever he could. It simply isn't appropriate for a contemporary community. We want to make sure that everybody has a chance to live a healthy life. And this motion today represents an opportunity for this council to step in to some of the newer ideas. There are all sorts of new traffic calming techniques. Uh, in Cornwall, in England, they're trying things called speed cushions, speed tables, something <coughs> called rumble strips and dragon's teeth. I don't know if we've ever thought about implementing those in our system. I've barely got any idea what they are, but they seem to be working there. And it's the same that it's kind of things that Anna was talking about, these visual and oral cues. So you don't actually have to spend much. You don't have to do much. But you have to make people understand that something's different here. You know, we're driving along at 40 or 50 k's an hour, but something's about to happen here. And what this is at the intersection of Trevallon and Gorge Road is some concealed entrances on very tight bends. So people come up Trevallon Road, they get to the flat, they speed up because it's natural to do that, and then they hit the tightest and most dangerous corner <laughs> in the whole area. And I've seen dash cam footage, and it chilled me. Mere millimetres cars are being missed. 
We talked to people this week, 10, 15, 20 accidents they've attended outside their homes. We don't want people sitting in their homes wondering if someone's going to crash through a barricade into the lounge room. That's how some people feel in that area. This area that we put forward as the showcase, how many photos are there of Launceston using Trevallon Hill? I mean, this is a beautiful part of the world, no matter where you're looking at it. Thank and you, Councillor Dorff. It's not safe. Your time's up. Do you need an extension? That's OK. I'll speak later. I'll be really interested to hear what others have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. No pressure, I think I... Um, look, can I congratulate Councillor Dawkins on uh, bringing this motion forward in the manner that she has. Um, she has asked for a solution, but she hasn't demanded a solution. She's asked for people to look at ways that this may be achieved. Um, it's a very difficult site. It's an extremely difficult site. Um, I think probably there'll be more noise if you start pinching people's driveways. But you have common sense put forward and ask for a way that this may be solved. It's not just a matter for council. This, this involves numerous other agencies. It involves state growth. It involves uh, TAS police. Um, it, it's not a straightforward matter. So our officers are going to have a little bit of work cut out, I think, trying to solve this. The other thing that I, re I congratulate you for is that you haven't asked for a time frame. So let's have a look. I think what you're saying is let's have a look at this. Let's see if we can find a solution. Yes, there are innovations being made all the time. Ripple strips, ru ripple strips, ruffle strips, whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, the biggest problem that we've got is people don't take notice of what's put in front of them. You can tell people that it's a 40 or 50k speed zone, but you can't legislate for stupidity and people will continue to break those laws. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I'm saying those people will still continue to do what they do. It's something that is going to require a great deal of work on the behalf of our officers. Um, it won't be easy and it won't be quick. You mentioned about the 40 now being the new 50. Uh, yeah, you're right, it will be. Um, so many places now in the world have changed. They've adapted, adopted. What was isn't appropriate anymore. I live in a suburb that was very quiet maybe two years ago. Now there's the rat run through there. People try to bypass two schools. They come through. Um, maybe one in five keep to the speed limits. Only last week we had a guy came around the corner, just missed a woman at a pram, and took out one of council's trees, might I say, Mayor, one of ours. Um, so, look, I, I think this is a good decision. I think it's a good, uh, a good motion. What will come out of it, I have no idea. We talk about, incidentally, just going back to the cyclists. There is a thing called meter matters. But I don't know how, in God's name, you implement that in Trevelyan, because there's no room. So... It's, it's, I don't know where you find the metre from. Um, you, there's no footpath to ride on. Maybe you stay off the bike. I, I don't know. But anyway, we'll see where this goes. It is a good motion. It's a common sense motion and perhaps one that needs to motivate us to look at how we can perhaps adapt some more things into and around this city. I was responsible many years ago for bringing in the 50k zone around the, around the city. I've still got the scars. Um, that did not go down well for quite a while. And here we are now, a few years later, looking at changing it back to 40. So I'd like to see what's going to happen in the next 20. Anyway, good luck with it. I think we'll get a solution, but maybe not the one everyone wants. Thank you. Councillor McKenzie. Thanks, Mayor. I also rise to um, support the motion. I think it's uh, paired back to, I think, a, a, a manageable type of motion now. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable to support it. Yeah, it's an interesting. I mean, I've ridden, I've ridden up that street in Malikra. Uh, I know how difficult you know, that hill in is Lycra. in Malikra. It's a terrible look, isn't it? Um, and uh, you know, it's it, it's a pretty hard hill to get up. Firstly, on a bike, uh, but secondly, if you've got a couple of cars, you know, tra travelling up behind you or coming the other way, uh, competing. So, the issue is the road and its width is really unable to be changed, to be quite frank, based on the way it's set up. We've got telegraph poles in the middle of in, in, in the middle of footpaths, so it is constrained by the physicality of where the road is and what's beside it being houses. Um, and without knocking down a lot of houses, we're not going to be able to change the road itself. So the only logical conclusion is to actually look at how you might be able to manage the traffic that goes up it. I think the reality is, as Councillor Cox has said, and I think one of the speakers said, if we make the roads better, people just go faster. Um, so traffic calming measures are the way to go in the, in, in the first instance, while we find a new solution. And if it's uh, 
Councillor Harris's one that sort of puts the flybridge over or it goes one way only uh, sometime into the future, that may be an answer that, that, that comes up. But in the short term, we need to start to look at things that actually do mitigate because there are more people wanting to walk and I think COVID brought a lot of those activities out. There are more people wanting to ride their bikes. Um, so the reality is what we wanted to do and that's hopefully for a safer and healthier um, lifestyle of people, but it's not that safe if you're having to compete with uh, with cars. So I think the motion now leaves a very open uh, opportunity for our officers to go and investigate some of the initiatives that Councillor Dawkins was talking about from other places in the world. Um, I'm a person that sort of talks about speed limits and think that if you knock it back from 50 to 40, it probably means it takes you an extra 10 seconds to get to the top of Trevallon Hill. So when you put it back in the context of that, it's not a very large space of time. And I always say to people, if you don't want to be late, leave five minutes early and you'll always be early. Um, but you know, the reality is we have to train people because people innately don't do that. They're always running late. They're always in a rush to do something. So I think this motion gives us a good open uh, stance for uh, for our officers to look at things and come back to us with something that we may be able to do productively to assist the people of Trevallon and you know, there are probably other places and what works on Trevallon Hill may work in other places as well. Uh, thank you. Councillor Soward. Thanks, Mayor. And I too rise to um, commend Councillor Dawkins for what she's brought to us today. Um, her uh, slight amendment to the words where we're looking to investigate I think is really, really important. And I know there have been a number of notices of motion in my time here brought by me and other councillors that if you actually say investigate, you're open to what comes back. If you actually start to put things into it, that the suggestions and constructive ones, sometimes that can guide us up things that uh, you know, may not be uh, state of the art or new, as Councillor Dawkins talked about. So investigating it, Mr Mayor, uh, to see what is going on out there at the moment in like communities, I think is very, very sensible. Uh, I agree with everything that the three previous speakers uh, have said and just want to add a couple of other extra things. Um, the timing of this is um, ind indicative to me, Mr Mayor, of bigger issues in this area across the city. And just uh, last night I uh, emailed and had a dialogue today with uh, General Manager Eberhardt about another area of the city with similar, not the same, but similar types of issues. And uh, I guess, Mr Mayor, what I'm going to say uh, right now is uh, you know, a statement of the obvious but also important to, to put on the record that sometimes when we're uh, in this capacity, uh, you know, we're charged uh, with tough decisions where we need to say, you know, hang on, you know, enough's enough, where we need to say, you know, let's just sit back, dismiss the rhetoric, dismiss the angst and go, just hang on. Councillor McKenzie talked about that 10 seconds extra to that trip up to Trevallon Hill. I remember being a member of this council, Mr Mayor, when we uh, made a decision to slow down traffic near the food vans. The world was going to end. The world was going to end because we, we were going to take, uh, people were going to take an extra 10 seconds to get along a short length of High Street. Um, it beggars belief to me, Mr Mayor, that in a time where I reckon if you said to every person in Launceston, do you care about your community? I reckon everyone would say, yeah. But the minute you ask people to slow down a little and take a little bit of extra care, again, the world's going to end. It's insane. I remember being a member of this council where we actively uh, engaged with uh, the rollout of these school signs that you would see across the city, the 40k ones that flash. Again, heaven forbid you've got to slow down in a school zone. Beggar's belief. Uh, Melody West, in her remarks, Mr Mayor, and, uh, you know, as someone who's grown up and knows that suburb uh, very, very well. She noted in her remarks around the fact that there's through traffic. Councillor Cox mentioned in his area where he lives, people who decide to take shortcuts and create traffic pressure. I think one of the things we need to do as leaders, Mr Mayor, is to say to people very, very clearly, be part of the solution, not the problem. Be part of the solution. Many of these challenges, not all of these Trevallon ones, by the way, because the physical infrastructure is challenging, the hill, the driveways that uh, Anna Povey mentioned, it's challenging. But many of these traffic problems are generated by people deliberately driving too fast and going you know, on some you know, convoluted shortcut that's not really a shortcut. 
I can highlight a number of areas across our city where people will contact councillors, they'll contact officers about uh, traffic pressures that people are generating themselves, not because it's a bad road, not because there's some other drama, but because people have got this idea that if you go up five side streets, you're going to get somewhere 30 seconds quicker. It's it, it beggars belief. I love the investigation element of this, Mr Mayor. I think, uh, again, and I'm hoping, with no pressure, of course, on our officers, that they come back not just with things that have a fit for this area, but some bigger picture views of what's going on in the world in this space. And again, one of the things that, you know, is really great is that, you know, we don't, we don't as a city, as councillors, as a community, we don't need to reinvent wheels. There's things going on in other like jurisdictions that we can look at. We can learn from failures. We can uh, uh, grab onto the coattails of successful initiatives. And again, uh, hopefully, particularly for the people of Trevallon in this particular instance, but in bigger cases across the city, come up with some things that make it safer in a whole variety of ways. Uh, the phrase 50, uh, sorry, 40 is the new 50 is, uh, has been mentioned. And again, you know, as I said, I, I just find it amazing. It'd be different if you're asking people to drive to a 200k trip at 40 k's an hour instead of something faster. But we're talking through areas where there are people, people moving, vehicles moving. Thank you, just, Councillor just Your a, time is up. Do you need an extension? Thank you. Move, Councillor Stodensek, and second to Councillor McKenzie. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you. Um, you know, it needs to be a bigger discussion. And again, in my view, Mr Mayor, and it is only my view, I'm hoping that as councillors we can be united on this, any of these sorts of discussions. Anything we can do to make our community safer has to be something that we need to seize on with both hands. You know? And we need to take that leadership. That's one of those times where it might be tough where you're talking with a group of friends and I've got emails as, as you have from people I know saying, oh, no, we don't want to lower the speed limit. And I respect people's view. That's, it's great that they've got a view. But when it's done to, to make something safer, I think is something that's really, really important. Uh, working in and around schools, you know, the schools we have across the city. We, we want people out walking. We want people out accessing the community, riding bikes. So uh, thanks, Councillor Dawkins, for what you've done here in uh, tackling this specific issue. I'm excited about what will come back uh, investigation-wise. And again, this council has led the state in a lot of things uh, over its history. I want us to be a council that leads the state in making our community and our roads safer places. But I also say in conclusion, and it's, and it's a, uh, not a challenge, it's a request for members of our community to be part of the solution. Be a sensible motorist. Drive to the conditions. A phrase that uh, the former minister I know, uh, Councillor Cox, used to use, the police use, the SES use. Keep safe, follow the rules and uh, make our roads safe places. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you to my fellow councillors. I'll try not to repeat too much of what they say, but I will um, certainly commend and uh, say that I do support Councillor Dawkins' uh, motion here today and to implement, or to investigate and implement some traffic calming measures on Gorge and Trevallon Road. Um, I'll go back a little bit. When I was a small child, for whatever reason, my bus to West Launceston took me via Trevallon, uh, which was always interesting because there was these... You go up through Gorge Road on Trevallon Road and there were these garages perched on the side of a cliff to myself and uh, I always wondered how they ever got out of their garages. Thankfully, as one of the residents said, the roads weren't so busy as they are now. Um, but nevertheless, that bus continued on up Salisbury Crescent and Ashley Avenue into a drop me off at Brahm Street and I walked down Wilhelmina Avenue. I mentioned those four streets because all four of those streets now have traffic calming measures on them. They weren't there when I was a child 50 years ago. They certainly are now. And that is primarily to divert the traffic around those streets to other roads that provide an alternative access to West Launceston. The trouble we have with Trevallon is there is no real logical alternative access. And that is something that we perhaps need to be considering. Um, ever since I've become a councillor, and uh, even before it, many people have expressed their um, fear of using those roads, because I, like Councillor Mackenzie, have gone up uh, Trevallon on my, in my Lycra, and on a push bike, as he said, where they, when you've got a car right up your bum, it is a most uncomfortable feeling, because you know you're holding him up, he can't give you a metre to pass you. 
And, uh, but there really is no other way to get up there. And so if you're going to ride your bike, you just have to grit your teeth, uh, own the road, and not be pushed over the side. Um, we're now seeing the increase of mountain bikes in the Trevallon mountain bike tracks in the State Reserve up there. And I think it's really time for not only a short-term review, but a long-term review of how Trevallon is connected to the rest of our city. Um, and I think probably to look at that, one of the things when driving up there today, or the other day, I noticed that as you come up Riata Road, just above the Pitt Avenue corner, should a fire occur in the bushland that is there, every house from there onwards has no escape. That is the only access road to all of those residents who live in Riata Road, New World Avenue, Havenbrook Court subdivisions. Several hundred houses. There's not a single way out of there. If their road was blocked there, you can't get out. You go and swim in the, across the dam, perhaps, but that's about it. I've long expressed a view that an alternative road and bridge to link Trevallon to Blackstone Heights should be on our city's long-term vision of our future transport links. In the medium term, I believe a foot and cycle bridge across the, the South East River linking Blackstone Heights to the Trevallon Nature Reserve would in fact enable access for mountain bikers to not have to go to Trevallon, but in fact perhaps park at Blackstone and ride through there on a dedicated uh, bridge. And imagine the view from that bridge if you're looking back towards the dam when it's in full flood. It in itself would be a great uh, tourist attraction. However, such a bridge neither lands or starts in our municipality. It actually runs between West Hamer and uh, Meander Valley, but it is all in the electorate of Bass. So that should be something that perhaps should be considered as part of our medium-term plans for what is Trevallon. In the long-term plan, I'd like to have a look to see what these roads can do. As Councillor McKenzie has said, you are landlocked with what you're doing with the uh, Trevallon Road going up. And so to me, the only way to improve safety is in fact to make it one way up. If you make it one way up, how do you get out of Trevallon? And again, you would have to look at the existing roads and say that Bain Terrace with its speed humps might have to become one way down. Uh, that then will bring you down onto the West Hamer Highway. You'd probably need an interchange of some sort there. Perhaps a uh, long talked about cross river bridge from Foster Street across to, Tamer, uh, to the West Hamer Highway would help relieve that traffic and not in fact direct all traffic back across Patterson Bridge, but in fact allow it to gain direct access into Invermay. These are all things that could be included in our long term plan for the city and particularly for the, Traval uh, for the suburb of Trevallon. Um, so whilst you know, we're originally were looking at what sort of things could we do, such as speed humps. I also found things called speed cushions and the textual finish on road when I googled what was available. But one of the, one of the very few examples that I found might be uh, achievable in the very short term is a digital sign that displays the speed of the car, similar to when you're coming off the Bass Highway and shows you. And just before that dip where you go down round and it says you should be doing 35 kilometres an hour, if in fact it showed a car they were doing 50 kilometres an hour, they may slow down and make the safety of that area a little better. So in summary, I, up, I support the intention of the motion and uh, look forward to hearing what the rest of the councillors have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I'll be brief because there's been lots of points raised and the opportunity for some blue sky thinking as well. I would um, love to say that I'm going to support the motion that has been put forward to us because I think it's important. And whilst I acknowledge that some great work is being undertaken with the Greater Launceston Transport Vision, I think what Councillor Dawkins and the people of Trevallon, as one part of the city who have a problem, are asking for are uh, some, you know, quick wins in terms of ways that traffic speed can be reduced. So I would suggest to our officers in putting together the work that has been asked for here. It's not a huge body of work. It doesn't have to be an expensive body of work. In fact, the front page could all be about trialling the reduction of speed from 50 to 40 for the two main streets. That could be the first page, and it could be implemented and trialled uh, with a start date and an end date. So we're not asking for a huge body of work that takes into consideration a bridge across the river. What I think Councillor Dawkins and the people of Trevallon want uh, in 2021 to see the speed reduction uh, implemented uh, through a variety of different strategies that the Council could consider, at least on a trial basis. Thank you. Councillor Spencer. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, 
this is a very difficult street going up there. I'm one of the blokes that worked in some of them lower houses and it is a nightmare trying to get out of them, believe me. Um, I don't think there's many solutions whatsoever. Maybe ripple strips might slow people down. The speed limit definitely needs to be dropped. Trying to reverse out of them houses is a nightmare. You've got no idea. Alan's idea on one-way street is probably a good, good idea if you can get another way to get out. Um, this unfortunate, there's been a lot of houses built up there in the last 20 years, three to 400 houses, so that's it's what has increased the traffic. Um, we have got to do something. The speed limit is probably the cheapest way to fix it with a few ripple strips and Alan's idea of um, a sign with the speed limit is probably a good idea. So I will we'll be supporting this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor Walker? I think I've um, experienced ripple strips, but I'm not so sure about the, the dragon's teeth. So, <laughs> but maybe, maybe that'll be the solution. No, it, of course, you know, around the world, and I'm sure our officers and, um, and other learned people would be aware of a lot of different uh, tra traffic calming techniques. As has been pointed out, uh, this is a particularly challenging area uh, with indeed growth, not just in Launceston Municipality, but also in West Hamer mun Municipality that you could say it has not been planned for, in a sense can't be planned for because of the restrictive nature of the roads there. Now this is not the only place in Launceston that has this issue. Older parts of Launceston, uh, especially the hilly areas, um, do have this. But I suppose the difference in that area has been that development of, of, of behind Trevallon uh, to, the, to the north and to the west. Um, so. Uh, you know, I'm not stating anything that's not obvious to most people, but I suppose my point is um, that the traffic calming, certainly I agree with and I will be supporting this uh, motion. I don't see how, if, if it ends up being 10 kilometres um, less, is going to make much difference to someone's travel time at all, um, but it will make a huge difference to the people living in that area. Um, and, you know, you're driving through their suburb or you are part of that suburb, and of course that should be important to you. My, my, my greater concern goes to that continued development and how we will, um, how we will address that in the future. Um, you know, connecting it uh, across to, to Blackstone Heights or through to Hadspin round the back, whatever it might be, might alleviate some of it, but I think the majority of this traffic that we're talking about is traffic that's coming towards the central business district of Launceston. Um, and that's an issue. Um, change is something that we can all resist at different times, but change is upon us, really. We do have options for different modes of transport. Uh, we do have options for different ways of directing our transport, uh, roads, calming measures, and I'm fully supportive of the council uh, pursuing that, not just in Trevallon, but also, more importantly, uh, the ideas that hopefully are being looked at at the moment for the CBD that were partly a result of the Gell report um, and um, in other areas where we have similar, if not as extreme, um, issues as we do in the foothills of Trevallon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Councillor Dakin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I won't repeat the repeat and I'll just do a little personal count, maybe humorous, but. Um, Miss West, I don't know Trevallon like you do at all. Um, I don't live there. Um, my fellow councillors that live in Trevallon actually don't invite me up there. Um, <laughs> there's a reason that's true. So, unlike Councillor Mackenzie, I actually don't ride up in like her up there either. But I'm a male and I drive a big ute, so that means I'm a good driver. Um, well, I wasn't having crack at you. Um, Look, the Trevallon I know is dropping my son off at 8.45 in the morning every Wednesday, taking him up to the Trevallon Reserve for bush class. That's going against the traffic. I have had probably eight near misses in the last 12 months. I've witnessed three accidents. I've been rear-ended once um, because someone didn't see my big ute. Um, absolutely commend um, this motion and, and bring it forward in a very common sense manner that identified a problem, it's been there for a long time, but no one's really had a look at what are the possible solutions. 
and not having to put a time frame on it is fantastic. So we can come back and look at the, the cost of what will be involved and then we, we go from there. So I will try and sit down now and not be up any more funny, but I do support your motion. I thank you. Councillor Stoltenzek. Thank you. Firstly, I would like to thank Councillor Dawkins for bringing this motion today. As a fellow Trevallanite, I travel Gorge Road and Trevallan Road three to four times a day, most days. My partner and children ride up and down on bikes and I hold my breath until I know they're up and down safely each time. Not being quite as brave, I drive to Penny Royal before getting on my own bike. I've witnessed many accidents on this stretch of road and many more near misses. Having travelled throughout Europe and witnessed some of the innovative measures they take to calm traffic, I agree with Anna Povey, we need visual cues to ensure people slow down. Merely putting up a 40 kilometre zone sign will do nothing except increase the number of traffic infringements. I look forward to some lateral thinking and some innovative solutions which will help make our community healthier, healthier and safer. Uh, thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor Dawkins, wish to close? Uh, just briefly, Mayor. Um, I will just answer Councillor Harris and I think Councillor Spencer talking about how do people get out of Trevallon Road. Right now what people are doing is a family member is going and standing out on the street and actually putting their hand out so that they can get their cars in and out or they're not parking anywhere near their house. Now, nobody wants them to do that. They're breaking the law. They're putting themselves in incredible danger and I'd hate to think that would ever happen again. So I'm, I'm really heartened by some of the words that I've heard today. I like the idea that something could happen in 2021. I didn't kind of want to dream of that because I know we've got an enormous amount on our agenda and incredible budgetary constraints. So I thank you all for your, for your words um, and let's wait and see what this investigation brings. Thank you. I'll put the motion. Those in favour, please raise your hand. And that is all councillors present. That is carried. Thank you. We move on to 17.1, QV Mag, call it Deputy Mayor. Is there a seconder? Councillor Finlay, you wish to speak to a Deputy Mayor? Uh, just briefly, Mayor, obviously a very comprehensive report and something that all councillors and members of the community would have received uh, with great, great support and open arms. I think it shows the diversity and the excitement that uh, is now permeating through everything that QV Mag is involved with. I, uh, I note the great success of the shop and the uh, amazing December, the record December that the shop had, uh, taking over, I think, $50,000 in sales, which is incredible. I also note the outstanding um, response that has been received with regard to art rage. And I wanted to take the opportunity to read into the meeting a wonderful letter that came to the QV Mag uh, from the National Gallery of Victoria's Curator of Top Arts. And he says he wishes to congratulate congratulate the Museum Art Gallery on the cur and the curators and organisers. Art Rage is a stellar space and curated exhibition. Great seeing such a diverse and broad selection of representation from across Tassie and I particularly enjoyed seeing the folios. So I think we're having people even from interstate organisations who are uh, regarding the work of QV Mag. We already know that the four current exhibitions on display at the Art Gallery as part of the summer season have just lifted the bar. It's incredible. The response that has been received from those uh, has been like nothing we've seen in years and it's to uh, the credit of all members of the team who've been working so hard. Uh, whilst not um, outlined in this report, will be included in the next one, you would have seen reference, a little teaser, on page 53 to cosplay and the, uh, the diversity of offerings that the museum is, uh, is incorporating into their program. You would have also seen under the learning category the wonderful response that came to Art Start, that wonderful annual exhibition that involves the work of students from across northern Tasmania. And you would have also seen uh, reference to the great groups of volunteer organisations that support the focus, the philanthropy, the underpinnings of the community connections in the uh, Museum Governance Advisory Board and the Friends of the Museum, as well as the Art Foundation. You would have also seen uh, Councillor Walker, there's reference there um, with regard to um, the repatriation, which is great to see, obviously a very important issue included there, detailed for everyone to see. But most importantly, I think what you see is the diversity of what the QV Mag through both sites, but also through the programs that underpin the offering are engaged with in our community and further afield. That should excite 
uh, all of us. Uh, thank you. Councillor Finlay? Uh, thanks, Mayor. Just a quick comment to follow up from the Deputy. Uh, congratulations again to the whole team for what's been going on. It is really fantastic after years and years of really wanting to pull out the best of the Museum and Art Gallery across both sites that we're seeing that really flourish. Um, I think it's great to connect with the community, the people who have long loved the institutions, the facilities and all that we've got there and all that we offer, but for the people, most importantly, that are newly discovering it. I think that's really exciting at the moment. The summer season launching has been spectacular to have so much for people to come in and, you know, explore and experience. Um, so congratulations on that outward to the community, but also to your engagement with us. I think our ability to be aware of and understand what's going on and the importance and the history, the depth, the breadth, the complexity and the beauty of it all um, is is more and more able to be appreciated and understood because of your engagement with us through these papers and the other work that you're doing. So congratulations to you and the whole team. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McKenzie? Yeah, I just rise to really endorse those comments. I think if there was a view that when we appointed the general manager to the role to increase the visibility and the use of the QV mag as being a key part of that strategy, and you've succeeded. So congratulations. I don't think I've ever seen as much about the QV mag mentioned in media uh, and around the community as I have in the last year or so. So I think it's a great congratulations to Tracy and her team uh, because they are living the dream and they're actually helping others in Launceston live the dream who didn't know the dream existed. Thank you. Councillor Spencer. Just got one question. Thanks, Mayor. Um, uh, the budget's not considered in this re uh, report. Um, will that happen in the next quarter, will it? Is that a question? Yep, yep. Do you get the question? Not considered <laughs> rebel to this report, the budget, for <laughs> September, December. I might just say, I mean, the budget um, is reported um, as it is through all matters of the council in the, in the organisational financial reports. This is a matter, um, this is a report that's bringing forward the operational report in terms of the activities of the, of the gallery. It's not intended to be a, a report in respect to the, the budget position. Thank you. No, thank you. Any other speakers? Deputy Mayor, wish to close? Oh, just briefly, of course, to remind the Council that value for money comes in a lot of uh, and a variety of different ways. And I think the return on investment that this Council is getting, not only through the current activities, but indeed through the work that's being uh, undertaken at the moment in terms of the future directions, shows the value that the cultural institution and the people that make up our QV mag have um, for our community uh, is, is absolutely of paramount importance. I want to finish on, um, on reference to collaboration because I believe that whilst um, we're doing a great job and we're on the way, we mustn't you know, get ahead of ourselves. We're just at the beginning of a journey that is uh, the QV mag reaching its full potential. And uh, the collaborations that have been taking place with organisations, with artists, the diversity of programming, the reimagining of what an institution like the QV Mag can do in terms of telling stories and being uh, the pinnacle of our tourism offering is only just beginning. So we certainly thank Tracy and the team for the great work that they have undertaken, uh, not only in this last quarter, but in, recent, uh, in the recent year. And we look forward to continuing to go across a, a, a journey that sees collaboration, partnership and storytelling uh, at the core of what QV Mag is and does. Thank you. I'll put the motion. Those in favour, please raise your hand. And that is all councillors present. That is carried. 19.1, Lisa of East Tamer Menchett, moved Councillor Finlay, seconded Councillor Soward. Do you wish to speak to Councillor Finlay? Thank you, Mayor. Um, just quickly, I fully support uh, the lease extension here for the East Tamer Men's Shed. Men's Sheds are so important in our community. It's great that we have the facility that can provide for them. It's great that their numbers are growing and therefore um, they're asking for an increase in the area. Um, and I commend this to Council. I thank you, Councillor Sauer. Any other Councillor wish to speak? I'll put the motion. Those in favour, please raise your hand. And that is all Councillors present. That is carried. We've got the lease of the Catterick Gorge Restaurant and First Basin. Moved Councillor McKenzie. Seconded Councillor Deputy Mayor. Do you wish to speak to it? I Councilor do, Mayor. McKenzie. And again, I think we talked about other leases last week and sort of getting things into a, an order where they're all of a similar tenure. Uh, again, this, I think, comes back to about 2006 
So as a consequence of that, I think it was pulled from the last agenda, which is noted in there to get the dates right, because they weren't quite right, which then adjusted the term of this lease. Um, I think uh, we've had COVID. Uh, we've had a number of things that have gone on in regards to this particular process. And I think at this point in time, to go out for an expression of interest elsewhere, I think would be problematic and not necessarily get the best outcome. Certainly my feedback in recent times has been very positive about what the offering has been done. Somebody as, uh, as late as yesterday was telling me how wonderful the, uh, the, the food and, 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 and drink offering was at the, the Gorge restaurant such that they're going back, a very discerning person in my view in regards to those sorts of things, they're actually going back again this weekend, they thought it was that good. So I think that's terrific that I think conversations were held probably two or three years ago probably meant that the current operator needed to consider whether they needed to lift the bar, and I think they have. Uh, I think that it all makes you know, really good sense that we give the current operator further term, because I think to go out in an environment such as this to try and seek a new operator might be problematic. We may not get a better outcome than what we already have. Uh, thank you. Deputy Mayor? Uh, just briefly, I guess I'd like to reference the work that's going into the draft lease and licence policy. Certainly appreciate that and the robust conversations that have occurred already in its development and say that this aligns with that. And in terms of things needing to occur to provide some certainty of the operators but also of the offering, um, I think it's appropriate in this instance as recommended. Thank you. Any other speakers? Question, Councillor Walker? Yes, thank you. May I ask a question for the CEO? Do lease ease of council properties have to, or are they required to uh, adhere to uh, policies which internally the council is um, following, which, you know, for example, um, the uh, end of use of single use plastics, for example, that we are, uh, you know, currently implementing internally? Is that something that. Uh, we're also asking our leases to do. Um, we can, sorry, yeah, um, so at the moment, the lease that's in place doesn't have that term, so uh, they wouldn't be obligated to do that, but we can certainly include that in if that's council's policy as part of offering the extension. Any other speakers? Councillor Walker? Yes, I will speak, thank you, Mayor. Um, and look, I, I, I do rise to you know support this. Um, I suppose the reason I ask the question, of course, it is such a sensitive area for Launceston. Um, it may be no fault of um, the operators there that you know people do choose to litter the area in all sorts of corners um, at at the Cataract Gorge. Um, I can only imagine that you know a fair amount of that litter you know does originate uh, from from the, the businesses that operate there. Um, and while that's certainly, like I say, not the fault of the business itself, it's something that is an ongoing issue. Uh, it's, it, it obviously has to do with education and any number of other things, uh, but everything and every step that the council can do to minimise that, I would encourage. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, is that, no, sorry, who voted this one? Well, Councillor McKenzie, you wish to close? I'll put the motion. Those in favour, please raise your hand. And that is all councillors present. That is carried. We go to 19.3, City of Launceston Annual Plan. Move Councillor McKenzie. Seconded Councillor Soward. Just to speak to Councillor McKenzie. I do. Um, again, I just like to acknowledge the huge body of work that the council undertakes. And I think this plan just shows how much we actually do do or endeavour to do in a year. So I think uh, congratulations to all the work that's going on in regards to it. I, I just had two comments I just wanted to make. And one was I note that we've got our accelerated capital works program. And I guess the word of caution I throw out there is I think that the, uh, the community is well stimulated with things that are going on in and around. And, and I guess progress with prudence and slowly, I think is probably something we should do and we should come back and sit back and let others take the heavy lifting while we don't need to, because I know it puts a huge impact on the officers in and around the council to, to run programs like that where they're dragging people off other jobs. And I'm just thinking just at the moment that we don't need to stimulate the economy as much as we may have thought we did when we put this program into place. So again, that's just a comment in regard to that. And the other one was just really regard to the ABCDE uh, program in relation to the Youngtown uh, activity. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited about what goes on, but having sort of other hats that I wear in the community, I just 
mindful about programs like this where we do it, then we hand a report on and leave it for the community to, to carry on with it. But I think we need to put some form of measurement exercises where we can actually go back and check that the work we did in these ABCDE uh, programs actually has flow through and it just doesn't die on the, on the vine because we're no longer there to push it. So we may not need to run it, uh, but I think somewhere along the line when we walk out of these things, we need to have some benchmarks to go back and measure against or some reporting timelines so that we can see how the community's handling the report and the activities that were actually put there. I understand it's basically the community's role to do it, but again, to get the best value for our money, I think it's extremely important that we make sure that we go back and check that the work and the money that we've spent in regards to developing uh, the reports and the things that they need to do in their community are actually regularly checked up on so that we can get the best bang for the community's dollar. Thank you. Councillor Soward. Thanks, Mayor. And I um, rise to support it as well and uh, just support the remarks made by Councillor McKenzie and just wanted to add with the ABCD uh, learning sites, uh, I think that building that community capacity is really, really important and uh, I'm sure many of us in this room, Mr Mayor, can think of times with clubs or organisations we may have had involvement with that sometimes, as a word of warning, when a couple of key players move on, uh, things can uh, fall uh, a little behind or by the wayside. Um, I think it also uh, quite obviously highlights the significant uh, aspirational work that we do. Uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot in here and uh, our hard working staff are obviously uh, working diligently to, to meet those targets. The only other thing I wanted to highlight uh, was something I'm particularly interested in and that is that regional sports strategy. Um, one of the challenges, Mr Mayor, that we all know we have as a city, and uh, it's uh, coming up in an item a little later in the agenda, is that uh, as the biggest uh, council that, that uh, in the state, and obviously a, a, a big city council that we are, um, we have facilities in our uh, borders, if you will, that are used by many, many people that aren't residents of Launceston. Now, not that that's a bad thing, I think that uh, the more use we can get in our facilities, the better. That's all facilities that we have. But the challenge is the uh, facilities cost uh, and repair and maintenance are borne by the ratepayers of the city as opposed to the users across the region. So that uh, regional sports facility plan, I think, is a really, really important piece of work. There's something else, Mr Mayor, that I think can come out of that work, which is really, really important, and that is the fact that in an earlier item, uh, Councillor Dawkins's item, we're talking about looking at what happens in other jurisdictions, looking at what happens around the world. There used to be a school of thought, Mr Mayor, with some uh, regional sport that every club had to have an oval. You know, if you're a footy club, you had to have an oval. If you're a cricket club, you had to have an oval. You had to have a this, you had to have a that, a soccer club. What's more sensible, and I hope comes out of this plan, is, is facility and resource sharing. One of the other important things as part of this uh, facility plan that's obviously very early in its infancy, Mr Mayor, is uh, looking at the resources that schools have. We have school ovals that sit there unused after 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, there are schools, and I know in our, in our community that have talked before about, uh, sorry, communities that have talked before in our municipality about building a new something, and there's a school over the road that that facility is sitting there. So more partnership opportunities. Anything we can do to get people fitter and more active is a really, really important thing. That regional sports plan is a, a perfect example. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor McKenzie wish to close. I'll put the motion. Those in favour, please raise your hand. And that is all councillors present. That is carried. 20.1 deputy. Councillor Finlay, second. Was that? No? Yep. I'll be right. Councillor Deputy Mayor, do you wish to speak? Uh, just briefly, because I know everyone will have a word to say on this, Mayor. Um, I guess this is a game changer, as the uh, Examiner newspaper reported it. A game changer for Northern Tasmania, a game changer for the state, and importantly, a game changer for this council. $208 million uh, future direction plan. What I guess, Mayor, I um, wanted to do in terms of my desire to support the, um, the, the draft framework was to unpack, I guess, some of the things that are contained within it, because uh, it's really important to me for people to understand that this is not 
the end of the road. This is not the decision. This is not us um, determining what's going to happen. What it is, though, is it's us looking at what's contained within this huge body of work. And kudos to the general manager and other members of staff uh, and external providers who have assisted us. Um, it is a way of us looking at this incredible asset and working out a new model for us to be able to provide facilities and sustainability to our community from a council perspective into the future. An incredible package that asks us, as part of the recommendations contained within the Future Direction Plan, for us obviously today to endorse the Future Directions Plan, that the council develops a strategic development plan for the stadium, which details all of the required future capital works and investment, that the council works with the state government to complete a business case for the development of the community-owned uh, indoor entertainment and sporting facility on the old bike track, together with the Southern Terrace and the Western Stand. And importantly for me, and I guess this is one of the ticks that, uh, that, that I liked and uh, members of uh, the community that I interact with liked, was the, the additional three courts, yes, but the additional uses that could come about as part of this uh, infrastructure. The opportunity for the development of a show court, the opportunity for 5,000 people to be accommodated uh, at sporting events and at cultural events. Indoor training facilities, recovering spaces, uh, functional and flexible spaces for cultural, educational uh, and, of course, sporting programs. The improved infrastructure. Point four in the recommendation that we lobby both the state and federal government to include the plan as part of the city deal. Uh, number five, that the council engage with the state government uh, to the new ownership structure, absolutely of critical importance to us and the ongoing sustainability of our council, as we know too well. Um, and obviously, point six and point seven in terms of, uh, in terms of the proposed stadia strategy. There's no doubt um, that this council, and it's outlined within pages 11 and 12, the uh, capital expenditure that has been required to maintain that standard to the level that is required is huge. Some uh, council has contributed some $20.38 million, some $20.3 million since 2008. That is just unsustainable moving forward. It's unsustainable given that we have a desire for more people to engage in sport and recreation. We have a desire to see a state team. We have a desire to see more games played. We have a desire to obviously see different codes of sport being undertaken um, at the precinct. So I'm excited, Mr Mayor, about all that can come from us um, today, hopefully, unanimously supporting uh, this draft Future Directions Plan. It's a huge body of work that has got us to this point, and of course there's a huge uh, amount of water to be travelled in order for us to get the best possible outcome. But my word, it's an exciting future that we're looking to create for our city, and uh, an exciting future for sport and recreation and other things in, uh, in Tasmania. Uh, thank you. Question from Councillor Harris. Thank you, Mayor. A um, question probably for the General Manager. Um, if you could tell us who the current users of Utah Stadium are, um, and also Invermay Park, because that is all proposed to be handed uh, to the uh, new Stadium Authority, um, who they are, what their current leases are, if any, whilst we're very early on in the um, program of where this might end up, I am keen to understand whether, in fact, the ground will still be available for community use, such as statewide football or the North Onsen Football Club, uh, or in fact even junior football. Uh, I'll speak later. It's CEO, not general manager, but CEO. CEO Thanks, Mr Mayor. Look, it's difficult for me to be able to answer the first part of the question in respect of the list of the, the current users, um, because they're, they're vast and many, obviously, so I can provide that after the after the event. But I think the the, um, the fact that we need to consider here is this is a, a, a long term and a, um, a strategic look at the future of the of the stadium and there's a lot of water to go under the bridge as the deputy has just 
that's just alluded to in respect of the, um, the different and future state of the users. So I think the best answer to your question would be to say that, that if the council were to approve the future direction plan today, that, that we certainly would enter into extensive discussions, not only with the council, but with the users of the ground, the state government, other stakeholders, and ultimately the trust to determine you know, an appropriate way forward for the, the users into the future. Um, I think the best commitment for this council to make at this point is that we will thoroughly engage with all users throughout the process, and I don't think that's that's the um, the best commitment that we'd be able to make at this point. Thank you, Councillor Finlay. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, following on from the Deputy Mayor, it certainly is a very exciting day today to consider uh, this plan. There's, there's been a long pathway to get to this point in the past 12, 18 months in terms of putting together the first step. It's, so, it's, it's really fascinating how much work you have to do to get to step one, um, that you have to be prepared, that you have to have an understanding of the full context and possibilities in order to then start the process of engaging and discussing and understanding how best to provide, not only for Launceston, but also for Tasmania. Tasmania is geographically so well placed for an investment of this scale to serve all Tasmanians. Uh, and that Launceston often serves all Tasmanians. And part of the conditional solution of this for this asset is that it becomes part of the Stadia Trust for Tasmania. Um, and that's super exciting because what it means is we've heard um, much said about the Museum and Art Gallery today, but equally uh, with this stadium, we have carried for so long assets for our region and our state, and it has been um, a delight to, but a cost to, uh, our council balance sheet and our expenses to carry that for the community. So strategically, as is always the way from our CEO, Mr Stretton, uh, he has taken it on board to work with our organisation, with other partners, with other levels of government to ensure that the community continue to have this asset and it can be an asset of good purpose for elite and community sport to go forward. And uh, an organisation and an asset for all, uh, such a wide range of users in this community as well, whether it be the obvious, the football and the cricket, the soccer, the rugby, whether it be netball or basketball, whether it be cricket, whatever it is, interestingly, by taking this massive step of a 208 proposed investment in this stadium. It actually releases funds for us as a council to invest in grassroots sports and grassroots facility. And I think if there's any message to be taken away from today, it's the first step. The conversations start here, that it's conditional, but it allows us to invest in grassroots and provide more facilities to our community, which are very much needed across a whole range of different sports. Um, I want to just reflect momentarily on the history to get us to this point. Around this table, um, Alderman Graham Beams had a huge vision for York Park, which it was at the time. Jim Bacon in the past had a big vision for Tasmania that set this in the centre of Tasmania. And I think that it would be fair to say that without that work and leading up to what uh, our CEO has done, and, and when I read these agendas or when I read these reports, I often say the same thing. But I think it's true to say for the city of Launceston and for our region that our council is so well placed because of the work of our CEO. An individual's capacity to hold the balls in the air of so many different projects of such scale and such importance on a statewide and to bring in so many people to positively support these initiatives is incredible. And I have no doubt that this pathway going forward, bringing people together to understand the investment, to understand the benefit, and to actually transition this from our books into the state stadia strategy um, is possible because of that work. I think it's really important to pause and acknowledge that. Um, we're doing it. Why are we doing it? It's because of the cost and the burden financially. What are the other things around? People talk to the Silverdome, they talk to Elf, and they talk to what we've already got um, at York Park at the moment. But for so few years, we've invested so little in those facilities that we need to do something significant now. There was a report, you know, this is obviously led through the AFL strategy report. Um, it identifies this 27,500 extra seats or the capacity for this stadium to go forward. Um, the 5,000 seats in the Māori Courts Stadium is really super exciting. Go Jack Jumpers and everybody else around Tasmania. Um, but what it also does 
is provide a solution to court shortages that we know and facility shortages around this region for our kids as much as for our elite players. Um, that it also has commercial aspects, it has the research, it has the education, it has the high performance facilities. Again, it will be the place in Tasmania that people can deliver these great outcomes. Um, so first step, conditional, um, amazing for grassroots as well as elite. Thank you for the work that you've done. I look forward to these conversations as they roll forward. It is a massive investment. There are so many other things to invest heavily in as well, but this is the time where these sorts of investments are possible. Um, so I fully commend the report to Council. Thank you. Councillor Soward. Thanks, Mr Mayor. And I um, uh, endorse the remarks in their entirety of the previous two speakers. Um, when this uh, story first hit the newspaper, I think it was last Friday, it reminded me back, it cast my mind back, Mr Mayor, to those joyful days of when I was a school teacher. And you would come into the classroom and you'd have your pile of information to give out to the students and say, just have a read through that before you ask any questions. And as soon as the bit of paper hit the desk, there'd be questions galore. And you'd say, it's in the sheet, read the sheet, read the sheet, have a look at that. Because when this story hit the uh, newspaper, a great news story wonderful news story as highlighted very well by the previous two speakers, we found this thing called water battery, where people are going, yeah, but, but, but what about the hospital? Why don't you put money into the accommodation for homeless people? Eh, not our remit, sorry. New hospital, this, that, the other. This is a great news story. This is a great news story for lots of reasons. Spelled out very clearly in the report, <laughs> Uh, and again, as I said, highlighted by the previous speakers. But for me, Mr Mayor, a couple of things that I'd like to, uh, to touch on, and, and I mentioned, I think, in my earlier remarks about the Indulge event on the weekend. By having a facility, an aspirational facility, but having a facility that caters for a whole heap of stuff in our community, how many times do we have people that come to us and go, why don't we have this event in Launceston? Why don't we have that concert? Why don't we have this thing? We don't even know where to have them. This uh, goes away to, to doing that. It also does that thing, which again, I mentioned in a previous item, where um, we, we've got something that's a multi-use facility. You know, a multi-use facility. We haven't, don't need one over here and one over there and one over there. We've got something that does a whole heap of different stuff. The frustration I have with a good news story like this and it comes back to my uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek remark about being a teacher and passing the task out and people not reading the information before they ask the questions. I think what happened with this was that when it hit the news uh, feeds and it hit the Facebooks and the social medias, people saw the cost, they saw a couple of other words, they saw the word council, they never bothered reading the plan. They never bothered jumping onto the website. They never bothered looking at the wonderful material on our social media that our staff put out, that's all there. All you've got to do is read it. Have a look at it. Get your head around it. Because to me, Mr Mayor, in this, there is no bad story. This is a great story. And I think uh, it might have been uh, Councillor Harris uh, when he asked a question. One of the wonderful things about this stadium, you can go out there at any given time and you can watch the best athletes be they cricketers or footballers or soccer players at the given time, run around on there. You can also go out on NTJFA Grand Final Day and see the under-7s playing on there. How good is that? How many other places does that happen about in Australia? You can go out Wednesday afternoon at the end of August and see the Northern High School Grand Finals with the girls' football and the boys' football. You know, high school students playing on arguably one of the best stadiums in the country. And with what's in this package, and I think it was Councillor Finlay touched on other sports, you know, we're going to have something that's going to be a real game changer. The other thing, Mr Mayor, that I'll mention, which is crucial, is that this isn't going to be built tomorrow. It's an aspirational plan. But think about what rolls out of it that's got nothing to do with sport, that's got nothing to do with community in terms of the, the events or whatever. The construction, the, all the flow-on money that goes out into the economy with this work... Again, I think it's something we do overlook from time to time, that particular impact that it has uh, in terms of the jobs it creates, the flow-on effects through our economy. This is something to be proud of. This, and I, I, I would commend the CEO on his work and leadership in this and his team of staff. 
It is aspirational. The report is very, very clear, and I would urge, and I know the examiner will be covering this story tomorrow, and I would be urging people who uh, uh, are out there to read it. And I know that our, our council staff will be writing this up. The mayor probably will be speaking about it. I'd be urging people to listen and understand what this is about. With the water boundary that I touched on briefly before, you can always do that. Anything we do, there's always, oh, yeah, but why didn't you do whatever? This is about the future. It's about not just about sport, it's about community, it's about events, it's about a whole range of things. Very, very proud to support it, Mr Mayor. Very excited about what the future holds. I touched before on uh, the arrangements at the moment that they're Your born. Your time's up. Do you need an extension? Very quickly. The costs are borne by the people of the City of Launceston. And this is a wonderful way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Spencer. Thanks, Mayor. One thing in life, your number one priority for your health. And we've got a broken hospital, they say, is the worst hospital in Australia. Um, I think before we start, the government starts spending money out there, I think the hospital should be fixed. I'm all for it, but the hospital system is in a crisis. It really is. We had a gentleman had a test, a bowel test, and he was positive. 10 or 11 weeks to get in to see someone about it. Totally wrong. Like a third world country. It's shocking. Shouldn't happen. Bed blocking all the time. Every, every weekend, someone goes in there injured. Unless they're very seriously, they can't get a bed. Um, York Park, yes, I want an AFL site out here. I want it to be in Tassie. We will have to make a $27,000 a $27, um, seat grandstand for it to happen. But honestly, the health system should come first. That's my opinion. Um, it's going to be great for the north, but it, it's probably six, eight years away before it gets, if it happens, it gets completed. Um, in that time, maybe the health system is fixed, hopefully. Uh, the Tamer River is an, another one. We could spend $208 million, that probably fix it forever. Um, thank you, anyway. Yep, thank you. Councillor McKenzie. Not sure how I can top that. Um, um, I'll try. Um, look, I, I, I'm going to probably approach this from a slightly different angle to all the other speakers. I'm, spent, I'm standing to endorse the, uh, the, the, the proposal, but I guess it starts from me, from I guess where the CEO, who was then a general manager, I think at that point in time, um, really said, right, okay, we've got to look at what we're doing in the city and what we can afford to continue to do and what's fair and reasonable for the ratepayers of Launceston to continue to support. And part of that was saying we provide regional facilities and I have been along with the CEO to the State's Grants Commission to say, it's not fair the way the State Grants Commission works in relation to looking after Launceston on the basis of the fact that it provides most of the significant regional facilities. So to me, this started out as a way of actually saying, OK, who should be paying for this uh, and how should we manage this going forward? Because it is not affordable on an ongoing basis for the City of Launceston and as other speakers have outlined, the costs associated with the City of Launceston continue to support these facilities and expanding for the needs of that particular facility for the requirements of the people who want to use it. Uh, and we can choose sometimes how we want those to go. So I start from the point of view that this is actually moving in a really good direction from the point of view is that the state will be providing the facility for the communities broader than the City of Launceston. So we've talked about amalgamations and the fairness and th things about how we continue to pay for these sorts of things. This is one way of actually putting it out and making it a much more broader community-based conversation, and therefore the need for amalgamation conversations maybe don't need to be quite as strong where some of these more regional facilities are funded by the broader public purse. So I, I, I like it from that point of view to start with. Now, you know, when I first started on this council, I think $10 million was a big project. We've come a long way since then by the looks of things. Uh, you know, the, the size of this project is, is, is immense. Uh, good reason, good logic and good development potential for the city. 
And the most important thing is that we need to make sure the community is at the heart of the decisions we make. Uh, and I think from a financial perspective, this certainly is. Uh, I want to make sure, as I think other speakers have alluded to, that the community is not shut out of using those facilities as a result of them being too good for them to use. Uh, and we need to make sure that the general public have an opportunity. And Councillor Sauer talked about the under seven football teams and things like that. We need to make sure, as part of I'm the. <laughs> Sorry, serious, serious keeping me in check. Now, yeah, completely lost the plot. Um, and, and, and I just, and I just, I just think that it's really important that we, as we move that community of interest across uh, to another authority, that we protect and make sure that our community get the benefits out of it. As uh, Councillor Finlay said. Uh, currently, we're spending three, four million dollars. I think is what the report says on, on on running the stadium out there. I think from the future directions plan, that will not need to go back into there, but we can then utilise it for a broader community. So the people who need the support in the community sporting areas will get the opportunity for us to actually feed that money more directly back into assisting all those sorts of things. So the logic. The way that the plan's been put together and the direction it's taking is really, really sound in my point of view. Um, we've got to get somebody to fund it, of course, uh, is the big issue, but certainly the logic's associated with it. And I think uh, Councillor uh, Gibson talked about you know, sport meeting culture. The reality is I think we decided way back when that sport was part of culture, so the reality of it is the blending of that and the more that interfaces in amongst it, I think, is extremely important. So all of those tick. We tick all the boxes as we go through there. So I commend the amount of work that the CEO and others within the organisation have done to put this together and put it in a logical procession, which actually now fits into a greater initiative from the state too. There's a number of other plans that will fit with this, which will actually, I think, help make this become a reality. So I think fantastic effort and let's go with it. I thank you. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to the other speakers. Um, I won't repeat much of what I said, but yes, I do stand very supportive of the uh, document in front of us and uh, congratulate the uh, CEO for all the hard work that I'm sure he and his staff did to make it a reality. As Councillor um, Mackenzie said, this is uh, but one small piece in a bigger jigsaw. Uh, if you look at the whole Inveresk area with the UTAS um, University there, the development of an 850 seat, uh, sorry, car car park, which will be used by this larger stadium with 27,000 seat capacity potentially, uh, it, it all makes sense. Um, and in fact, I guess if you look back at the history of York Park, you know, really people took a punt 20 years ago uh, with the build it and they will come uh, when everyone said, why did you want to spend so much money on such a, such a suburban oval? And uh, yet now it is certainly one of the best grounds for the AFL. And just going back to uh, Indulge, uh, my wife was standing in a line at Indulge on Friday night and someone said how nice the artificial carpet was, yeah. uh, when in fact it was the, uh, the natural lawn that we'd spent two and a half million dollars uh, growing down at uh, Landfall. So uh, it, it is a fantastic service. Uh, surface, and it is a very good stadium for what we have, but really for it to be better and for the city to be better, we need to uh, hand it on to a more appropriate authority. And to me, that is the, sta the stadium authority, uh, which will be funded uh, as a state authority, and they will be the ones that will be applying for the $200 million of funding, either from within the state or, in fact, from federal grants or potentially someone like the AFL who may wish to contribute, as they do with other stadiums around the country. So, from my point of view, I think this is a great uh, step forward. Uh, I look forward to seeing what goes on uh, as far as its development is concerned. And I'll just close by uh, quoting the uh, CEO of Visit Northern Tasmania, Chris Griffin, by saying that this will turn Launceston into the sporting capital of the state. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dakin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about stadiums today, hospitals, rivers, airports. I'm going to talk about business. And the CEO, Michael, has worked tirelessly on this, I think, for the last three years. Um, it's a strategically good business move. We're going to be reducing millions of dollars of operational um, funding out of the budget each year to removing it altogether. Uh, attracting more people to the region, not just to use the facility, but we're going to be creating jobs, we're providing opportunities for those that are studying in the university and, and elsewhere, and providing great entertainment, which will flow onto tourism, hospitality, car hire, retail, 
uh, and there's a lot more other businesses. Um, but this is not just for the city, it's for the entire region. And I think, believe that is a great business, that's a great investment, and again, I commend you to CEO and fully support the motion. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Any other speakers? Councillor Walker, question? A couple of questions, Mayor. Um, as Councillor Han Harris mentioned, there will be a new parking facility down there. Um, co well, own, oh, well, co-opted with the university uh, for 850 cars, but can the CEO um, explain how um, an increase of maybe 30 to 40 per cent capacity will be catered for um, in that region, I suppose, apart from the, the potential 5,000 uh, seat stadium, more, more so the, the bigger events, um, how that will be catered for. CEO. Thanks, Mr Mayor. So, in negotiating the, the lease agreement and the, the arrangements with the university to construct the, the new car parking for themselves to, to obviously service the, 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 the students on the precinct as well as our own, um, our own car park, we've negotiated to be able to have access to, to all car parks um, that have been provided within the precinct for, for major events. So, and we've kept that flexible on, on the understanding that we had when we were negotiating that, that that's likely to increase in time if, for instance, the jack jumpers or tornadoes or others play play games at, at the stadium or that we have you know our own Tasmanian AFL side, which will clearly require the use of those, those car parking spaces. Um, obviously, we want to encourage people to, to walk to the city, uh, from the city to the, to the ground. We want to have that MCG or that Adelaide overall experience where people do come across the new pedestrian bridge and enjoy the, the new precinct, which is going to be extremely vibrant once the university establishes and we have more business out there. So, I mean, I don't think parking around the actual ground is, is, is um, as crucial as it is about making sure it's well connected to the city and that we've got people um, using multiple forms of transport to get their public transport, bikes, walking, rather than just reliant upon parking close to the stadium. But I do think um, for the purposes of being able to cater for the demand that we, we will generate, the, certainly the parking that we have through the through the, um, the university development, and I guess flowing out to what we've done at Churchill Park, there, there, there's quite a bit of parking in the precinct that we think should be sufficient to cater for the, for the demand. Uh, thank you. Further question? Yeah, another question, uh, Mayor. Um, the proposed um, the sport centre that would be uh, you know, adjacent to York Park is, of course, you know, pro uh, proposed to be built on uh, potential um, land that can potentially flood. It's on a floodplain. Um, what mitigation actions could be included in such a development uh, to not risk such an investment, such a big investment, um, on a floodplain area? I see you. Thanks, Mr Mayor. So clearly the council or, or the trust when it's established will need to be a model applicant in respect of dealing with, with, um, with floods. Um, we, we have worked with the university, for instance, around their developments to make sure that they are best practice in respect of being be able to resilient, be resilient but also be able to, to respond to, to a flooding event should it occur. So, look, there's a lot of, a lot of I, should, I was going to say water to go under the bridge, but, <laughs> probably, uh, but there'll be a lot of time to work through that, but we will have to ensure and will ensure that, um, that we meet best practice with respect to making sure it's the most flood resilient building that we're able to provide, because clearly that is a requirement of our planning and, and clearly is something we're committed as a council to achieving. Uh, thank you. Any other speakers? Yeah. Councillor Walker? Yes, I wish to speak. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and of course, um, football is very popular in Tasmania, basketball is very popular in Tasmania, so it's completely understandable why this would be a very popular suggestion, a popular draft plan, um, and in many ways, you know, I'm very supportive of the idea of having a Tasmanian AFL team. I look forward to the day that we do have that. I'm not sure if this is the pathway to that. While I'm not against the development of the stadium per se, um, the way that many things are added into this, um, the development of a, an additional stadium on a floodplain, uh, an additional facility on a floodplain is not something that I can easily support. Um, the York Park already stands as it is, so I, I have you know, less issue with 
uh, upgrading an existing facility. Um, but I too have the concerns that if this becomes the major ask for Launceston City, that other areas can and indeed are already neglected by state and federal governments, partially as a result of the spending that we would be making in this area. Now, I know that it wouldn't be our facility anymore. I'm somewhat supportive of the model that we would hand this over to a trust that would no longer be um, the, the, the responsibility of Launceston Council. Um, but what I do have uh, issues with is uh, in regard to um, us having such a large ask and putting ourselves potentially in the category when it comes to state and federal funding, which of course you have to remember is all of our money, it's taxpayers' money, um, that other areas will continue to be neglected. Now, it may be a long draw, uh, bow to draw, and I accept that other councillors will say these have nothing to do with City Council, but it does insofar as if City Council uh, are clear about the requests that they do make, whether it be for affordable housing in Launceston, whether it be for um, bicycle lanes, whether it be um, for an improvement to our hospitals, that state and federal governments have to stand up and listen to those requests, as they would to this particular request. Now, it may be the case that it will bring additional business to Launceston, it will be a boon for our economy, but it is also a massive amount of money to spend on a singular project that is, um, by all means, going to be welcomed by many, but also is going to put us in a situation where it's not easy for us to demand further things for our city for a considerable amount of time. So, in the balance of all that, I struggle with being able to support such a large amount of money being put towards uh, such a singular purpose. Thank you, Mayor. I thank you. Any other speakers? Deputy, if you'd have the... Oh, you, you're closing, but anyway. Councillor Phil, I just have it for... I won't be long, but I do want to just say a few words. I just want to say that I'm extremely supportive and thank the CEO and the staff. I think a lot of others, like Robert, has worked very hard to make sure that this has come to fruition and we've got to this stage. As it says in, the, in my notes, anyway, a draft future direction plan. And that's exactly what it is. It's a draft future direction plan. It's something that we are going to work on to develop. We can start asking questions out there about operational things which may happen or may not happen. Not relevant for this. This is a draft plan. Do we see the vision? Can we see where this wants to head? Is it something that would be good for our city? Is it something that we need for our city? And I would say yes, yes, yes. It's something we need for our city. Yes, it's AFL has been mentioned and lovely to get an AFL team and that was part of it. But it's more than that, as Councillor Finlay knows very well. National Basketball League, already going to come to this state. Nowhere to play in the north. There's also the soccer, A-League, the fastest growing sport with basketball probably that is really growing in our state and around the country. Nowhere to play a game when A-League come to our city. Nowhere, so they've got to go somewhere else. People want to come and watch these games. And then on top of that, there are, there's going to be individual courts for basketballers. We have got a shortage of courts around northern Tasmania. Absolutely, what is it, 10, something like that, courts that we need. This will be three of those, and there's going to be at least three in the northern suburbs as well, and there's others that we still need more courts. We can always say you should put money here or you should put money there. What we find, some of that won't be for me to determine. That'll be for the state and federal governments to determine. I know that they want to invest in sport. I know that people need to be playing sport. I know what sport does for a community, what it does for people. And to see people active with basketball, soccer, football, whatever it is, if we don't invest in that, we'll have more people queuing up to go to hospitals because they're not going to be fit and active. We need to have people to be active and to be doing things. As to the cost of this investment, yeah, a lot of money, no doubt about that. Geelong recently have upgraded their stadium. I don't know whether you're aware of that. Geelong, $317 million it cost to upgrade their stadium. Perth, we all know they've upgraded their stadium, which is well into the million dollars. Uh, was it $1 billion? A billion dollars. So this is happening right around the country. And yes, I think 
It's something that needs it because sport is important. It's important to our community, but not only sport. I'll add, and I'm great to see the deputy move this and to see his interest in the arts, which is also something, a place for people to come and have concerts and whatever, indoor facility, 5,000 seats is absolutely amazing for our city as well. So, so many benefits. I think it's something, but let's remember, this is a future direction plan. This is something where we want to head to, not tomorrow. We're not going to have 200 million here tomorrow or the next election. This is for the next five, seven years. Who knows how long it's going to be, but it's going to take us some time. And I believe if the community gets on, on board with it, the state government gets on board with it, and the federal government, in the long term, we can achieve this, and it can be something that will be absolutely fantastic and exciting to continue to make our city one of the great regional cities, not just of Tasmania, but of the world. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I'd like to start by thanking everyone for their contribution to this item. I think it's really important that we have a diversity of viewpoints and perspectives that are brought to the table. I think, though, that this is the opportunity for us collectively to show aspiration and vision for our city of the future. We know that the city deal, as the respected framework for which our city can lobby and achieve great things, is the mechanism that this project would be sought to be entered into. And whilst I certainly acknowledge the um, nervousness of some councillors that other aspects of our community could miss out as a result of the funding required for this particular project, I say to you that in 2019, with the over $30 million uh, return that came from visitation, tourism and events as a result of patronage at that stadium, this can only be a game changer for our community if those stats continue to increase. I remind all councillors that at the moment it is costing our ratepayers, our residents, over $5 million each and every year just to operate the stadium, not taking into consideration what effect it's having on our depreciation schedule. And so I would remind all councillors who are nervous about the amount of funding required, about the vision required, about the aspiration required, about what impact that amount of money could have on other parts of our community, should this model uh, take effect. I remind all councillors that today in endorsing the draft future framework, this is a vision for the future, a way of working forward to get state government, to get federal government, to work with users, to work with other members of the precinct about what could be created as a result of this significant model. A $208 million uh, future directions plan that would have significant spin-offs for our community, Mr Mayor. A number of proposals that would see, as Councillor Finlay referenced, the biggest infrastructure update and expansion to our recreational facilities since the 1960s and also the ability for community, community use. Of course, an idea like this would only be socialised and embraced by the community with significant grassroots use. It's the only way that a model such as this would work. And so we know that the shortfall that's been referenced by Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Sowden, Councillor Finlay, and so well through the correspondence that we receive from users of facilities in Launceston, that the provision of indoor sporting venues and infrastructure floor spaces will only be a benefit to our community in the sporting sense, but in so many other senses as well. I believe that this is a great news story, a great show of the vision that we as councillors in 2021 could have for the city of the future that we're creating collectively. A city that values its people in Trevallon, a city that values its river, a city that values every aspect of its community that can be benefited from this collaborative, holistic, part of the city deal approach that we together could show is us working together for the betterment of our city of the future. Economic, social, cultural ticks all the boxes. It deserves unanimous support. Thank you, Deputy. I now put the motion. Those in favour, please raise your hand. Those against? That's those abstaining. Councillor Spencer's abstained, just for the record, and Councillor Walker against the rest are all four, so the motion is carried. Thank you. We'll now close the meeting.